Um, so welcome everyone um, to another session in the Design Systems Virtual Summit. My name is Basha, I work here at UXPIN and UXPIN is a full stack design platform. And in case this is your first time encountering us, we do offer a platform for prototyping, collaboration, developer handoffs and documentation powered by design systems. If you're interested in checking us out, we do offer a free trial. And we're gonna drop a link um, right now in the chat. And the entire summit is sponsored by Atlassian Design, the team focused on building simply powerful experiences for Jira, Confluence, Bitbucket, and all Atlassian products. They're actually now hiring in both their Mountain View and Sydney offices. Uh, so if you're interested, you can learn more about the Atlassian Design openings at atlassian.com slash uxpin. And we're also gonna drop that link in the chat for you guys to check out. And um, like I've said before, the session will be recorded and the recording will be sent out after the event and posted online. And after the talk, please stick around for the Q&A um, and let's get started. I have Ben Wilkins from Airbnb here. And Ben, the mic is all yours. All right, thank you. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, this is the first time I've ever given a webinar, so this is an interesting experience for me. I wanna thank uh, UX10 for inviting me to speak at this. Um, this is this is my title slide. This is uh, this talk is called Thinking in Symbols for Universal Design. Um, it's a talk that I gave a few months ago, but uh, a lot has changed. This is a rapidly evolving field, uh, and a lot of exciting development is happening around it. So I've kind of annotated this deck with the Roman numeral two to show that evolution. Um, but without any further ado, let's get started. Uh, my name is Ben. Uh, I'm a design technologist at Airbnb. I work on design systems uh, and experimentations with emerging technology. We're, we're um, in this interesting point in UI design right now, I feel, where uh, things, have gotten, things have gotten easy, and as they've gotten easy, they've also gotten hard. The complexity of their, our apps are getting more and more uh, extreme and the pressures to develop rapidly across platforms are, are, are also mounting. Uh, the expectation to design like a company uh, like Airbnb or Apple or uh, Google is uh, there even if you're at a one person startup and we've started to establish a lot of techniques for designing across platform. Um, this entire talk was kind of kicked off uh, by by this question that I was asked uh, about probably six months ago now. Um, a designer came and visited uh, us at Airbnb and asked our team how we design for Android. Uh, he asked me specifically. And um, I had to stop and think uh, about this for a moment. And this is this is digital product design. This isn't necessarily kind of the upstream uh, level design. But my, my answer was really that I don't. I, 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 when I think about product features, I, I rarely think in terms of platform. Um, so I don't design for Android or iOS or web or, or print or whatever, whatever, um, whatever platform I'm targeting uh, because all of my designs are, are, are functional. There's like this, this idea that if I'm thinking about the value that I'm delivering through the app, I should, uh, I should be able to kind of express intent rather than handing off, uh, handing off uh, pixels. Uh, and so a lot of times you'll, you'll, as a designer, create a static mock and it will be this massive collection of pages. Um, but there's a secondary stage to that, uh, that expression of design, which is, to go beyond the visual aspect of it and into the functional. Um, and this, uh, this is kind of the domain of design systems right now. Um, at Airbnb, we use a design system, which we just call DLS, which is 
named fairly uh, literally. It is design language system. Um, we came up with hundreds of names for this thing, and then we kept on saying this, and so uh, that's kind of kind of where we landed. Um, and uh, it's it's a system that's made up of a lot of components, and you'll you'll recognize this if you've ever used our product. Uh, these components are the building blocks that we that we use to design every feature, uh, and it's a growing and iterating system. Uh, each of these components is really a functional expression of what it does. And if you look at the examples, like looking over in that second row or second column there, you see icon rows and switch rows and toggle action rows. And these are named functionally and they exist uh, across, um, across platforms. We have, uh, a set of guiding principles that that we use um, when we we think about evolving this system. Uh, it should be unified, and this is just the idea that each part uh, belongs to the whole. That there. Uh, it's a product in itself. Um, it should be universal, and this has to do with uh, with Airbnb as a global company. And I think increasingly all companies are are global to a degree. Uh, the The challenges of internationalization and localization are are things that uh, we constantly have to think about. And, and so, in delivering on our promise of Airbnb belonging anywhere. Uh, our mission, um, we need to consider how our design system is localized across uh, languages and cultures, continents, uh, globally. And this is the final element of it, and I think that this is aspirational, um, but Airbnb's design should be iconic. Uh, and I think to, to a degree, we've succeeded, which is probably why I have the privilege of speaking in, in front of you right now. Um, I want to focus on universal because uh, universal design is, is, is extremely difficult. Um, so actually a term borrowed from architecture uh, and this architect, Ronald Mace, said that designing all pro uh, designing products and the built environment uh, should be in designing products and built environments. Things should be both aesthetic and usable. Uh, and we see this we see this in um, in architecture with uh, accessibility features, and we uh, we also see it in in digital products. Uh, and this is this is a massively uh, difficult problem and it's one that we always have to put ourselves uh, we have to step outside of ourselves it's it's difficult but uh, but it's possible um, one of the one of the guiding factors in in a lot of our work and this is basically my team's charter is that you can innovate on products uh, without first innovating on the way you build them um, and as design systems have matured, I feel like 2017 was a big year for design systems. We're also seeing a lot of, um, we're also seeing an evolution in the tools that, uh, and the thinking around them. So uh, there's this great blog post on, on Airbnb's design blog uh, called The Way We Build. And um, it, it seeks to explore how we can innovate on products and how we can how can we can think differently about them. I will include a link to this at the end of the presentation, uh, but I also encourage you to to look it up. Um, in defining design systems, uh, there's a lot of thinking, and uh, this this is a blog post from a Facebook designer, uh, Dan Eden, who I actually met. Uh, 
as I was preparing these slides to give this presentation the first time. Um, and it was kind of embarrassing to have uh, his, his work and his blog post open as, as I was setting up these slides. Kind of walked into Airbnb's office with a, with a friend. But he, um, he defines a design system as this collection of metaphorical nouns and verbs um, that allow for the expression of intent. And this is a recurring theme. Uh, that rather than designing pixels, we're expressing intent in our designs. Uh, it's about developing a shared vernacular that can exist across uh, discipline from engineer to product manager to designer. Um, in Dan's uh, conceptualization of this, he talks about this uh, recursion of design systems so that brand colors compose uh, atomic elements um, and then those in turn compose larger structures like forms and pages and uh, any number of other things. He's actually gone on to write uh, a second post he posted um, last month uh, in January called Subatomic Design Systems uh, and it has straight up mathematical expressions of how design systems are composed, which I actually think work in some ways better uh, for his theory of recursion than uh, vocabulary as a metaphor, um, but it does get fairly dense. It's, it's, incredibly, it's incredibly interesting if you, if you want to dive deep, um, and I'll include a link to that as well. At Airbnb, we've taken a slightly different approach. Rather than having these uh, tiered levels of recursive elements, we, we have uh, basically two, two sets. We have our design primitives, and this is our, um, our set of colors, our type scales, and uh, our, our spacing. Uh, we design everything on an eight pixel uh, grid that has been predefined. And, um, this allows flexibility within the system. Uh, these colors have all been vetted for accessibility. Uh, so we have uh, guidelines around uh, how to set type in, in, in these elements. And we try to make sure that everything is AA compliant um, at least. And that, that kind of caters to our goal of designing for a global audience. Uh, and then we have the second tier, which is um, which is components, and uh, we we've, we've created this flat component hierarchy. Uh, so every component basically exists at the same level. Although you can see that there are classifications within components. We have a series of headers and a series of rows. We have our listing display cards um, and primary buttons. But ultimately, each component is a sticker sheet. Uh, and in flattening this component hierarchy, um, we don't have to think about how that button is composed or whether or not uh, an individual designer. This helps us ensure consistency. Um, we've created this federated system of components where we have Designer, we have a core design team that's responsible for DLS, uh, but we also incorporate designs from our product team. So this should be a living system. Um, one, of, one of my coworkers, Kari Saarinen, uh, is an incredibly talented designer. He's a lead on our DLS team. And he wrote a blog post uh, called Building a Visual Language. And he, he, he writes that, a unified design language shouldn't be uh, just a set of static rules or individual atoms, um, but it's an evolving ecosystem. And in order for this ecosystem to continually evolve, it can't be maintained by uh, an isolated team within the company. Uh, we really need the contributions and talent of all of our designers in order to do this. Um, and what that looks like in practice is as uh, we compose screens and uh, as we compose elements, these flat sticker sheets are, are basically just jammed together and our product designers are able to um, 
think about their pages as these collection of components. Uh, I think that increasingly this method is coming becoming commonplace. Um, but elements within the design system are repeated in different contexts to uh, allow uh, to receive different properties and display different data. And so you can see that uh, that user avatar row there uh, used in two different contexts with just different information in it. Um, and uh, that com that com shared component set, uh, here we go, there's a better highlight of it, allows you to um, express intent. This is a, the name of this component is actually a user details row. And you can see those components kind of jammed together, screens are composed, and uh, the, the code is representative of the final rendered product. Um, this really reduces the gap between design and engineering. So as my designs express intent or my code expresses intent, uh, you could easily translate between either element, either on the left or the right of the screen here, uh, the intent expressed by the screen rendering and the intent expressed by the code are identical. Um, and that expression of intent is also agnostic of device. So you can see something could work equally well for Android, a device which nominally I said that I, I didn't design for, um, or a tablet. And uh, yeah, that's that's uh, that's Airbnb's design system. A, a brief overview of it. And this is um this is a system that evolves. We change our colors, we change our type scales, and as we change those those primitives or add new components, everything maintains in, in uh, consistency because we we change things holistically. Uh, so. Hopefully, everything that's implemented using this design system uh, will continue to be updated as the design system evolves, which historically has been a problem with something as large as Airbnb. Um, you can probably still find legacy web pages that predate our design system on our on our website, uh, and they're they're kind of a, a source of um, source of embarrassment for our design team. Maybe embarrassment is the wrong word, but they're definitely uh, uh, something that sticks out, and we want to we want to think about how we can update those. Um, we have another project about uh, designing a system for marketing pages, which we'll we hope to address that. So design systems are having a moment, um, or they've had a moment. This 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 whole past 12 months this has become a buzzword and every every company wants one and every company is open sourcing theirs uh, this is this is a screenshot from a github repo that collects uh open open source design systems and kind of ranks them based on what they have um, and components or voice and tone interaction guidelines uh, and this has this has a two-sided uh, or this has is a double-sided coin in some ways. Um, a lot of designers feel like their creativity is being stripped away. And uh, Adam Michaela, uh, who's a designer in VC, he was actually one of the early designers on Airbnb's design system, uh, refers to this as the industrialization of interface production, which is the a, a, interesting way of saying it but he he essentially says that each designer um at a at a company that has an implemented design system is uh becomes a production designer or a pm in some ways uh just assembling components um i i don't agree i i kind of agree i actually had a long conversation over drinks with adam michaela about this uh, just before just before Christmas, and uh, he makes he makes some excellent points. But 
where we differ is that I think that we 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 often misconstrue uh, this idea of creation as achievement um, and the idea of recreating everything uh, uh, is is seen as like a badge of honor in some ways and and this is this was Adam's point is that we shouldn't recreate things um, but there but there is like this element of creation that goes along with this and uh, as a design system evolves, uh, we we have this creativity that is expressed in that evolution, um, and that, that evolution is actually achievement in itself. And this is this is like the fundamentals of design. Uh, we talk about how great artists steal, uh, or um, no one no one creates anything from from scratch and i think that standing on the shoulders of giants is foundational to any company uh we we never write our own software frameworks from scratch rather than using open source uh equivalents um and we we try not to redesign interaction paradigms uh so why would we redesign uh, a, our brand or if our ui library uh, reflects our brand and it addresses our needs we shouldn't necessarily be uh redesigning it um this is actually a quote from uh lucas smith who i work with uh evolution is achievement and he's talking about kind of the state of design systems uh he, he says that we've been um evolving digital design for 30 years or even 60 years um 1970s or even predating that um so we should we should learn from those achievements I love this brand. Um, this is this is an example of something that's so iconic. Uh, you 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 see this style, and it's becoming more predominant. But um, Mailchimp has has managed to kind of systemize their brand in a way that's so iconic and uh, and uh, recognizable. Uh, I was in Atlanta uh, last May, and uh, Mail trip is headquartered in Atlanta and downtown, and you start to see these murals uh, that's painted on the walls there, and even this collection of billboards. And this, these billboards are an example of a really simple design system, um, but the the customization and points of creativity uh, are are really apparent across these across these elements, um, and it's really hard to argue that this system constrains the creativity of the designers. And MailChimp is actually good at doing this in, in, in their product as well. There are these moments of self-expression for the designer, which really uh, allow the personality to shine through. Uh, and MailChimp has an incredibly evolved design system. Uh, their voice and tone, uh, is consistent and is actually uh, one of the archetypes for early design systems. They've had this for for forever, uh, and man, it's it, this is. I feel like we all aspire to have a design system this well defined and also this expressive. Um, there's this quote I love, and it's uh, from Zach Holman, who's uh, he was at GitHub when um, when he when he wrote this. And it's from a blog post, uh, and he he kind of uses this to take a stab at Google Circles, uh, the, like the the idea of dragging and dropping elements and or all your friends into the various circles and uh, applies it to a product. But if we think of our design system as a product itself, really the evolution of this of this is like don't give yourself shit work either um we don't want to be dragging and dropping pixels if if you're if you're trying to express intent within a product um and our tools have, i don't know how many of you remember designing websites in photoshop uh that that used to be the state uh, of of being um, if we use design systems, 
in theory, we'll spend less time pixel pushing. Uh, we, we use tools like Zeppelin to automate redlining. Um, less time kind of spent defending your margins or your white space uh, in meetings to people who don't understand the aesthetics um, and less back and forth. And more time actually designing, more time actually building things. Uh, and we're kind of in this Cambrian explosion of tooling around design systems. And I think that's evident by the fact that I'm giving this webinar uh, over sponsored by uh, UXPIN. We have this massive ecosystem of design design tools which are popping up. Um, I don't have I don't have the time to to go over all of the different tools that we that we that are out there right now but i kind of want to highlight some which are which are thinking design systems first in, in a lot of ways um i've been new i've been playing with figma a lot lately uh and figma's component library uh is, is this new approach on a design system. And it actually really falls in line with Dan Eden's thought of these recursive components. Um, I, I wish I could, I could probably give like a whole hour long talk on like uh, different component system implementations across Sketch and Figma and uh, Envision Studio and UX pins like design libraries and everything like that. But I'm gonna save that for another time. Um, but uh, Figma's component library uh, is kind of this searchable set of drag and drop elements, which allow you to quickly compose screens. Uh, and I think this is indicative of even traditional design tools, which are, are essentially drawing tools, trying to, um, to simplify working within a system. And uh, Sketch also has a library like this. Uh, Illustrator has visual elements that you can drag and drop out of uh this is uh, this is a direct reaction to this evolution in thinking that design should be systemized and then you have another class of tools um and this is an example of one uh this is compositor lab and these are kind of code code first tools which um allow you to uh express your design in a series of constraints and uh, they're directly tied to the underlying implementation. Um, and so Lab uh, by Compositor is a tool which, um, which allows you to basically render all your React components and use them uh, in conjunction with other elements of their ecosystem or even with pure React code. And even Airbnb is kind of getting into this space and we talk about design tools. Um, I wish I had a better screenshot of this. I, I kind of threw this slide in last minute, but we open sourced a tool um, called Lona a few months ago, and this is still in, in fairly early stages, but the intent of Lona is um, to maintain an endpoint agnostic design system. And what I mean by endpoint is if you think of uh, any rendering of a, of a UI component, um, whether that's Sketch or Figma or um, an iOS app or React code for your web or Android, the definition of that UI and the way that UI is presented um, should be independent of uh, independent of the the target, um, and so. Lona seeks to kind of systemize the constraints and visual uh, expression of, of, a, of a component um, independent of its code base and will then generate code for any render target. This is a super early stage tool, but um, the, idea, the idea being that uh, I think right now it will render iOS code. Uh, we're hoping to add Android and DLS. Uh, or Android and React as well, uh, and then Sketch and Figma on top of that. Uh, so once our design team or our production design team has kind of standardized all these components and created these, we can render those anywhere for uh, consumption by any discipline within the company. Um, and hopefully this, uh, this will be adopted more broadly than just within Airbnb. 
I want to take a moment and look forward too. Um, I think that the should you build a design system uh, question has kind of come to a fever pitch and everyone just kind of agrees, okay, yes, to a certain degree, we should have design systems at our company. The complexity of that system may vary uh, kind of team to team or company to company, but um, having some level of systemized design uh, is, is, is really important. But why? And where is this going? Like, uh, is it just for consistency or brand expression, maintenance of legacy code? Uh, all of those are excellent reasons. Uh, but I kind of want to talk about this idea of expression of intent. Uh, because for me, when I, when I design, I, I tend to start with my expression of intent um in my notebook and this is kind of the expression of intent for these slides when i when i first uh when i first started writing this talk um i had written out a doc and that i'd made some sketches for my layouts uh and then i eventually jumped into keynote but foundationally that the content from that initial um initial conceptualization hasn't changed, it's just kind of this iteration and translation to higher fidelity. And so I, um, I wanted to kind of take that uh, idea and if, if you have a de defined design system, uh, then can that expression of intent be enough to generate uh, a high fidelity prototype? And so, uh, when I gave this talk live, this was like the systematic reveal, but we have this kind of wireframe and uh, we have this expression here, which is an image, a header and a paragraph of text. And that drawn on a sheet of paper uh, in combination um, expresses the idea of uh, an element of our design system, which uh, we call an editorial marquee. And uh, I wanted to think about this a little bit farther and start to think about, can you express different elements of the design system? And so this is, this is a series of training data that I actually uh, put together where I drew out um, these elements over and over again. And, uh, as and then I prototyped the this environment using uh, open frameworks, and this uses basic classification. Um, and this is a kind of this is current technology, but it's a machine learning algorithm that isolates these images uh, and converts the recognized gestures into elements of our design system. And you can see in this video. I'm placing sheets of paper in front of a webcam and uh, those components are recognized and are rendered into a web page in this kind of approximation of an app. And I think that this is, a, this is kind of like the logical extreme. Um, in theory, with enough training data and with enough uh, presentational data, you, or a, a well enough defined system, you could draw out your entire app and, um, and in turn, that would uh, that would render um, a prototype for you. Uh, and since since then, uh, this this came out more recently. Um, a series of a set uh, a group of Microsoft interns uh, put out this much more polished app, uh, kind of building on that same idea. And here's a video of this app in action. Um, it's the idea that you can draw, uh, this is using a Surface Studio, draw and that will recognize your gestures. Um, they've even gone one step farther and included uh, handwriting recognition uh, in here to, and this, this generates that first stage of prototype code that you can, uh, for them, take, uh, take your app and um, and build on top of it. Uh, so where I was going from ultra low fidelity to ultra high fidelity, they're going from fairly low fidelity to, to uh, medium fidelity of wireframe. Um, but has this has very practical applications. 
I think we're going to see more of this automated translation in product design in, in the future. Um, one of my first projects that I, that I did at Airbnb was this search engine for our design files. And this is, this is kind of an interesting project uh, because in order to search all of our design files, I had to, I had to process all of our design files. And so the, what, this, what this did is uh, we use Box for our file share, but I don't think that's really, really important. Um, it took all of our design files uh, saved on Box and cranked through them and, it, and kind of extracted all the information and metadata for them uh, and allowed you to, to, to search them holistically. If you're processing all your design files and you're able to recognize the components within them, you can imagine a world where uh, every design file on save is automatically processed and created, uh, converted into a coded up prototype. Um, that's uh, that's still a, a world to come, but uh, I think I think we're working on it, and uh, I, I don't think it's that far off. Um, I kind of want to close with with this thought because often, like uh, I I get asked, and people at my company get asked, um, what are the best practices around design systems? What are what are the ways to do this? Which tools uh, should we use? And even though I've kind of got, given this overview of a sampling of tools, I think my coworker really summed it up. This is Kari. Um, there are no best practices. These are still fairly early days. Uh, your company is unique and uh, you should evaluate kind of what's out there in the world. Um, no, one, no one really knows uh, or no one has fully figured this out yet. Um, so yeah, thank you. Uh, this has been fun. That, that's all I have to say. Uh, I think we're going to open it up for some Q&A. And while we do that, I'm just going to throw out some links for uh, some of the stuff that we've talked about. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much, Ben. That was very insightful. And we do have a few questions coming in. And in the meantime, I'm also going to launch a poll. Um, so if you have a couple minutes, uh, feel free to fill that out. Um, OK. Okay, uh, let's get started. And for everyone, um, if you do have questions, please drop them into the Q&A box um, just so that it's easier to keep track of everything uh, rather than the chat. And um, some of the questions um, are pretty general. Not sure if we're gonna get through all of them, but um, can you tell us a little bit more about how the design team is structured at um, Airbnb and how it has evolved over time? Absolutely, yeah. So when I, when I joined Airbnb uh, just over two and a half years ago, um, the design team was about 20 people. Uh, and now we're, now we're well over 200. So it's grown, it's grown pretty rapidly. Um, and Generally, how our team is structured is we have four core businesses. We have our homes business, we have our trips business, we have um, our upscale business, and we have uh, our China business. And all of those teams work independently. But we also have uh, a uh, concept of supporting teams, and that's... Um, that's our infrastructure business. And so our DLS, uh, our design systems team and our accessibility design team, our localization teams all belong to infrastructure. And we work with product teams across those businesses to uh, make sure that our design systems uh, fit their needs and they can contribute back to the system as well. Uh, Within each one of those businesses, there are small product teams which focus on uh, specific features and verticals. So we have uh, search teams, we have booking teams, uh, and that's just a function of how large our company has become. Great, thank you. Um, so you talked a little bit about um, 
in collaboration between your design team and the engineering. Um, what are your thoughts on um, designers coding? Should designers learn to code? Um, how would that change the workflow and the team dynamics? Uh, I always joke about this. Uh, a lot of our designers do know how to code. Um, I, I, I actually worked as an engineer as well before shifting into design full time. Um, I, I feel like our, a lot of the tools that we've built at Airbnb kind of just add fuel to that fire of should designers learn to code. Um, I firmly believe that coding is a tool uh, similar to any of the other ones that I've mentioned. And if you're working in a domain where that tool solves your need, then by all means, um, is coding necessary to be a good designer? No, not, not by any stretch. Uh, I, beyond that, I, I don't feel like I need to weigh in too much more. Okay, um, so a quick follow up to that. Um, someone is asking, um, what if um, the engineering teams want to use different frameworks like bootstrap or material design and overlay the design system as more of a style guide? How do you convince them to collaborate and build your own framework? Is this even a worthwhile battle uh, while the design system might still be in a pretty immature phase? Uh, I think that the framework that your engineering team decides on building on top of, if you've expressed to them um, the appropriate requirements of your design system, uh, then and bootstrap or material or some other framework addresses those needs. I think that that's a call to be made by your engineering team. Um, if there's some reason why that won't work or if the, if the visual design uh, will be compromised somehow or the functionality of it will be compromised somehow, then that's, that's a decision um, that you can make in collaboration. But ultimately uh, I think that design or product or anyone else uh, dictating what framework should be used on an engineering level is a mistake. I mean, in theory, you've hired talented engineers to, to build your product and uh, their judgment should be respected. Thank you, that's very insightful. Um, we also have a couple questions about the future of um, automation within design. Do you think AI will actually replace the job of a designer? Will they become obsolete? Uh, on an infinite timeline, maybe. I think that um, the same, if you, if you look at design historically, uh, there have been a number of innovations. Uh, typesetting used to be incredibly difficult and now it's incredibly easy. Um, digital tools have uh, allowed us to iterate faster and with more precision. I think that automation and AI are are similar. That um, that designers' roles may change, where we spend our time and develop our craft may change, but will we be replaced? If you if you look at if you look at the volume of digital products that are being designed, uh, I don't think that there's a huge risk of that in the short term. Okay. Thank you. Um, that's really awesome. And in terms of um, how your team approaches philosophy or hierarchy when building components, um, do you have one? Uh, it looks like some of our listeners have found it to be a struggle to balance complexi complexity, flexibility, and simplicity of use. Um, can you comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there, there are two versions of the design system in some ways. There's this visual expression, which is this flat sticker sheet. Uh, and there's actually the implementations across platforms uh, where, again, engineering has exercised their judgment on how to best architect the, that expression of the design system. And the customization points and, and like the holistic nature of the component uh, may be different on an engineering level than on uh, a, a sketch file level. Ultimately, the, the API to our design system or kind of like the consumable layer, uh, whether you're a product designer or a product engineer should be the same. Uh, that's uh, 
kind of this named system of components and then also this primitives layer, which is type style, spacing, colors, etc. cetera. Um, in terms of complexity, I think that that's why we chose that fairly flat structure. Uh, reasoning around this kind of idea of layers of recursion of design components uh, is extremely difficult and also not necessarily uh, transportable across platforms. Um, so simplicity is key. The, the flatter you can make your design system, the easier it is to adopt. Uh, education is definitely one of the biggest barriers to any company adopting a design system. So uh, yeah. Simplicity, simplicity, simplicity. Okay, great, simplicity above all, it uh, seems like. Um, so what do you um, do to make sure that the design system is actually being used and implemented correctly? And what happens when you find out a deviation? Yeah, uh, I wish I had a solved answer to this. Um, we have noticed and if you open up our, our product across mobile web across ios across android there are deviations cross platform um, we did a full audit at the end of last year to address those deviations um, we are looking into higher efforts of standardization and i think uh, the lona project which i talked about briefly uh, is symptomatic of that we're we're trying to remove the deviation or the potential for, for deviation by uh, specifying the implementation of the design system independent of the individual code base. Um, this is still uh, a work in progress. We've also explored uh, using image classification and recognition to um, try and snap components to, to guidelines. Uh, Consistency and deviation um, are, are ongoing things. Uh, we've, we even built a, a linter, uh, which we, are, we can run on our design files. Um, all of these are experimental and uh, not to be uh, kind of taken as best practices, but this, this, that's just to say that this is an ongoing challenge, especially as you scale your team. Okay. Uh, great. So as a quick follow up to that, since you just talked about some of the challenges that your team faces, um, what would you say has been the biggest challenge in scaling the design system across a large number of people and teams? Uh, education and the creation of new products. So um, a design system is a product in itself. Uh, and just like learning how to use Instagram or Facebook, there is a curve. Uh, we, we talk about this generational gap between people who are comfortable with social networks and uh, those who aren't. Similarly, there's this generational gap within design systems uh, and uh, a lot of designers still come from a fairly traditional background. Um, current education around design uh, isn't, isn't necessarily at the cutting edge of the digital age and design systems are something that while they do have historical context, uh, have really only entered the digital realm in the last year or two. Um, education, simplicity. Uh, and then the other thing is, what happens when you want to change something holistically and not just add a component? Uh, how, do you, how do you account for that? And how do you allow for themeability and customization within uh, a design system? Uh, the, these are kind of, unanswered questions, but um, any way that you can find to drive adoption and educate your, your design team, um, as well as empower them to make wholesale changes so that they don't throw away uh, the entire system in, when they want to make a simple change uh, is, is beneficial to addressing those challenges in my experience. Wonderful. Um, so we just talked about um, education and you also touched on um, a little bit on whether or not designers should code or if it's helpful. How do you onboard a designer who knows how to code versus one who doesn't know how to code? How different is that? Uh, we, we have a standardized onboarding process. Um, although we invite designers to collaborate on our divine design system or design tooling, regardless of, of their domain expertise. 
Um, we do have some designers on our team who are more comfortable in the technical realm. And uh, one of our designers actually built out an entire framer library for prototyping using our design system. And this is kind of on the extreme end of uh, a technical designer, but he, he created a library which allows him to define screens in Framer using uh, just uh, JavaScript object notation, which is just like a set of properties. Uh, and um, it just loops through that and renders out his panel. So he can quickly build prototypes doing that. Uh, on the other extreme side, there are, there are designers who um, have highly developed sense of aesthetics, but don't necessarily even uh, know how to open the terminal. So they get the same onboarding, but I think it's as, as you grow within a company, uh, allowing you to express whatever talents you bring to the table. Great. Um, and if you could provide a quick insight into your guys' own um, design system. Some users are wondering whether or not you do any A-B testing on your components. Yes. Um, so <laughs> we do A-B a -B testing on everything. Uh, Airbnb is a very data-driven company, um, and we're lucky to have like the, the, the traffic and volume to, to test basically everything. When we first launched our design system, uh, we did an A-B test on it as a whole and had a massive drop in conversion. Uh, our first version of our holistic rebrand, um, one, I think introducing any massive change to uh, your user base will damage conversion, uh, but it was, it was really important from there to start to drive those numbers up again and so we do that through um, accessibility improvements through different treatments uh, of sliders and switches and uh, features but uh, in terms of whether or not you need to do that uh, if you if you have the luxury of a b testing then by all means do um, I think that heuristic testing and uh, qualitative testing are, are also really beneficial. Um, kind of use your judgment and then ask your coworkers how they how they how they feel about one uh, pattern versus another. Okay, and how do you measure the success of your design system? Uh, we measure it through adoption internally, um, which is uh, something that we're that we're working on uh, consistently. We do um, accessibility and internationalization audits on all of our components to make sure that we're uh, able to ad address the needs of the broadest uh, percentage of the population possible. And then we also um, we also A B test. Uh, and we look for improvements in development velocity of, of product features. Also, we, we ask all of our designers and engineers how they feel about it uh, on a quarterly basis. So um, internal adoption and kind of uh, designer developer happiness is pretty foundational as well. Wonderful. Um, so I think we have time for one more question um, and to kind of wrap this up really quickly. Um, what do you think as designers, um, is there value in helping practitioners other than the engineering team adopt pattern languages? And if so, which department within the company do you feel would most benefit from a design system? Oh, interesting. Um, yes, I think that, uh, I think that the designer engineer uh, divide is is one that is interesting to me because of all the disciplines in the company, those two are potentially the most similar. Uh, even if uh, our tools or, or thought processes may differ, we're essentially building products. Um, I think that uh, we talked touched on A-B testing and uh, qualitative testing. Research also benefits from design systems because it allows for quicker iterations of prototypes. Um, product managers uh, benefit from design systems because it allows them to 
develop features more quickly uh, in conjunction with the designing and engineering team. Um, localization obviously benefits because, uh, and our accessibility teams benefit because uh, the components have been vetted uh, for compliance with um, compliance or even compatibility with longer languages, right to left text, uh, contrast ratios, etc. Um, but I, I think that the benefits of design systems extend across product development, and uh, that is everyone from the C level down to uh, customer support, uh, standard interaction patterns, uh, and uh, benefiting a wide swaths of people. That's great. Um, thanks for the insight, Ben. And I wanted to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, and thank you, Ben, for sharing your knowledge and experience. That was a very engaging and insightful presentation. Um, thank we, you. We do have another um, presentation and a UX Spin demo coming up in um, just about 20 minutes. So if you can stick around for that, that would be fantastic. And a quick heads up, um, unfortunately, two of our sessions for tomorrow have been canceled due to unforeseen circumstances. Um, we will still have the UX Spin demo and everything will be updated on the website uh, really soon. Um, so quick heads up about that and we hope to see you in 20 minutes. Awesome, thank you everyone. This is a pleasure and a privilege to talk with you. Thank you again, Ben. Have a wonderful day. Take care.